Hi, welcome. Today's lesson is on the amazing periodic table. You need to get the lab handout that we had because there's things on the lab handout that says fill it in based on the Ed Puzzle video. So get that lab, lab handout, follow along, and write in the missing pieces. So pause the video, get your handout and a piece of paper and a pencil, and follow along. So hopefully you have everything ready. We're going to start with the section, find that on your lab handout, talking about metals, metalloids, and nonmetals and their properties. So hopefully you have this on one of those periodic tables and you colored in the metals, which are most of the periodic table, the non-metals, and make sure you got the right elements for the metalloids. So you might want to write this down. This is boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, polonium, and astatine. So you know which elements are metalloids. Metals have a lot of similar properties, which you found some in class. Uh, we talked about they were malleable, which means they were not brittle. They did not break when you hit them with a hammer. We didn't talk about, but they are ductile, which means you can pull them into a wire, like you can make a copper wire and a nickel wire. They have luster, which you should have seen in class. They're shiny. They conduct heat. That's why we use them as pots. They also conduct electricity. That's why we use copper wire for electricity. Um, and many of these also react with acids. The nonmetals kind of do the opposite. They're not malleable. They're not ductile. They, they're dull. Um, they don't conduct heat well or electricity well. So they're opposites each other. What about the metalloids? Well, sometimes you have a properties a little bit of both. You looked at silicon. Silicon was shiny like a metal, but it was brittle like a non-metal. It also conducted electricity like a metal, but not as well as a metal. In fact, it's called a semiconductor, and we use it in computers because of that property. Now, take out the area where it talked about the different families on the periodic table. You can pause this video and make sure you got the families right on the periodic table. And I want you to add a few things. So also take out the last periodic table, which is blank, and we're going to add a few items to that. One item I would like to have you add is put an arrow up and down, and that's what we call a column. So this is a column up and down. We also call that a family or group. So write these words down on that blank periodic table somewhere. Also on that blank periodic table, going this way, we call that a row. We also call it a period or an energy level. So write that down. I could say this is the second energy level or the second period or the second row. So add all of those things to your blank periodic table at the end of the lab handout. Pause again and now find properties. There were blanks that said fill these in from the video. So pause this and you can write it down. I'm just going to kind of briefly talk about it. Alkali metals, which we're either going to demo or I'm going to show you a video about that, are very reactive. They even have to store them under oil so they don't react with the water in the air. If they do react with the water, they make a basic or an alkaline solution and they're very soft. Alkaline earth metals are not quite as reactive, but they do react with acids. Um, transition metals vary a lot. Um, they have also a lot of compounds that have really bright colors. Halogens are highly reactive nonmetals, and if you get them together with an alkali metal, you get a very big reaction, and they have a lot of variability. Fluorine is a gas all the way down to iodine, which is a solid, and noble gases don't really do much on the reacting side. Fine, we're kind of going fast, but you can pause the video. Now find the section where we talked about atomic radius. And the simple definition is the atomic radius is the radii of anything, is the distance from the center to the outermost um, circle or the distance from the center to the outermost electron. I gave you a chart, not this one, but something similar where you could see how the atomic radius changed on the periodic table. And one of those changes is kind of surprising. So as you go across a row, the atom sizes actually get smaller. And if I asked you in class before you saw this, 
Is neon bigger than lithium? Neon is right here. It's atomic number 10 and lithium is atomic number three. I'm pretty sure you would all say neon is bigger than lithium, but that is not true, at least in size, uh, not weight, but in size, neon is much smaller than lithium. And then I asked you to come up with a reason why that was true. So here's another way to see this. We have hydrogen here and um, helium here, and it gets smaller as we go across the row. So this is a row here, and this is a row here. As we go across the row, it gets smaller. So as we go across the row, it gets smaller. But as we go down a column, it gets bigger. You probably would have guessed that anyhow, but they get bigger as we go this way. And so as we start, here's one down the same row. Um, it does get bigger and bigger as we go down a column. As we go across a row, it gets smaller, but when we start a new row, it gets bigger. So right on that blank periodic table, as we go across a row, write this arrow in these words, the atomic size decreases, but as we go down, the atomic size increases. So pause and write this on your blank periodic table, which won't be blank by the time we're done with this video. Then you were asked to come up with an explanation of why that would possibly be that neon is smaller than lithium. And so we're gonna see if you got this right or not. Well, if you look at this and remember the definition that it's from the size or the radius is from the middle of the nucleus to the outermost electron, and you look at this chart, all of the outermost electrons are in the second energy level or the second circle or the second shell. So you might think instead of getting bigger or getting smaller, maybe they should be the same size, but that's not true either. They do get smaller. So why do they get smaller from the inner um, center of the nucleus to the outermost electron? Well, that's because we also have to look at the nucleus. The nucleus goes from three pro protons to four to five to six to seven to eight to nine to 10 protons. And protons are positive and electrons are negative. So the protons are pulling on all these electrons. They're pulling them towards the nucleus. So as we go across this row, we have more and more protons pulling on this second energy level, on this second circle here. And as we have more protons, it's actually pulling that second energy level closer and closer and closer to the nucleus. So the second ring actually changes inside and it size and it gets closer to the nucleus because it's being pulled by more and more electrons. So as we go this way, even though they're all in the second energy level, the outermost electrons, the, they have more protons pulling them in, making them get closer and closer or the atoms getting smaller and smaller. Wow, did you? Did you predict that? Did you get that right? Well, that would be great if you did. If not, just put down the right explanation now. What about going down a column? As you go down a column, we have one energy level, then two energy level, then three energy levels. So every time we go down, we're adding another energy level, adding another circle, which is farther from the nucleus. You might say, wow, this has 11 protons, so maybe it's really pulling a lot in. Well, it gets a little more complicated than that when we add an extra energy level because these electrons between the outermost electron are kind of getting in the way of the protons, and that's called shielding. And we're not gonna get into that, but if you take further chemistry, they'll go into the more and more details. But the simple explanation is it gets bigger as we go down a column because we add a ring every time. So first energy level, second energy level, third, and all of those are farther from the nucleus. So there you have it. Write those two explanations down, and we're going to try another one and see if you can follow along with that. First energy, I mean, first ionization energy is what we're gonna talk about now, but what is ionization energy? Ionization energy is the energy needed to remove the outermost electron. And why do we care about that? We care about that because atoms will gain or lose electrons to become like the noble gases. And to lose an electron, 
The electron has to be pulled away or it has to be ionized. You have to have enough energy to remove that outermost electron. So which atoms have high energy levels, high ionization energy levels? Well, let's go ahead and look at the trends. Here are the trends for ionization energy. These are the rows and here are the columns. Helium, neon, and argon are in the same column and here lithium to neon is the same row. So as we go across by row, the ionization energy increases. So as I go from lithium to neon, it goes up. As I go from sodium to argon, it goes up with a few little exceptions here, but it increases going this way and increases going that way. When I go down a column, the ionization energy goes down. Why is that? Well, let's first put it on the periodic table. So on that blank periodic table, we're adding some more stuff. Add another arrow and say ionization energy increases when you go this way and ionization energy decreases when you go this way. Why is that true? Well, it's the same logic as we use for the atomic size. We know that the atomic size gets smaller as we go this way. And we know that the protons get more and more. They increase as we go this way. So if I want to remove an electron, I am going to remove it and pull it away from the nucleus. The protons are pulling it in, so I am pulling it away from that nucleus. So the number of protons matters. The more protons, the harder it is to remove it. But also I have to think about the size of the atom. Think about holding two magnets. When they're very close together, they are pulled strongly toward each other. But if you hold the two magnets far from each other, the pull is very diminished. So the closer the electrons are to the nucleus, the more pull you have from the nucleus. So as I go this way, I have more protons pulling on the electrons and the electrons are closer. So more protons and closer means it's gonna be harder and harder and harder to remove an electron as I go this way. And that's the trend. Ionization energy increases going this way. But if I go down, I get farther and farther from the nucleus and that means the magnets are farther from each other, so they're easier to pull away. So as I go this way, it's easier to remove an electron. And the last one we're going to do is electronegativity. And electronegativity is the opposite of losing electron. Now I want to gain an electron. So electronegativity is atoms' ability to attract electrons when bonding. So how do I attract an electron? I have to have them really close and a lot of protons will help me attract uh, an electron. So pause the video and predict the trend. Is it going to increase going across or decrease going across? What about down a family? Is it going to increase going across or decrease going across? Pause the video and see if you get it right. Did you get it right? In net electronegativity increases, so it's easier to gain an electron or attract an electron going this way. And it decreases this way, so it's harder to gain an electron or attract an electron going this way. And that's what we see in this table here. As you can see going this way, it goes up, it increases the electronegativity, and it decreases it going this way. We're going to ignore the transition metals because they have a lot of exceptions to the rule. What's missing from this table? If you look at the periodic table, what's missing? It doesn't have any noble gases. No noble gases. Why? Because they do not usually bond, so they don't attract electrons for bonding. So why was this trend true? Hopefully you remember that as I go this way, I get more protons closer and the electrons are closer so I could attract some electrons. So it increases going this way. It decreases going this way because the electrons I'm trying to attract are farther and farther away. So it's harder to attract them this way and easier to attract them this way except for the noble gases because they usually don't gain electrons for bonding. So there you have it. 
Come to class and ask questions if you have any.